If GM wins its chess game and prevails in its arguments, who benefits? Corporate executives benefit from their privileged perks and compensation packages, often earning more to get fired than to stay on the job. Lawyers all over America benefit from the triad of corporate retainers, dealers trying to defend themselves, and the open faucet of taxpayer contributions. It has also been reported that top leaders in the United Auto Workers were given participation in the future management of the retiree trust funds. Who loses? The everyday auto workers. Because corporations have received special treatment for decades, both financially and politically, to shift jobs and capital investment overseas. The much maligned mainstream car dealers all across America and finally you, the American taxpayers. Many objectors, strategists, and persons of interest have asked, what is GM really up to? Why would a car company dismantle 25% of its franchises and even hope to regain its momentum in selling new vehicles to the general public? The answer is, of course, that the automaker doesn't intend to disturb the proximity of these franchise locations at all. Look at the approach that Toyota Motor Company has taken over the past 50 years to expand its heavily concentrated network of mostly metropolitan dealerships. Toyota awards satellite franchises to existing dealers in order to establish remote locations, thereby sharing marketing costs, administrative burdens, and management oversight. As it develops an ominous version of the Toyota strategy, General Motors fully intends to hand off many of these franchises to politically correct insiders. This good old boy network of volume-oriented dealers intends to reopen the franchises right under the noses of the victims. For this corporation to dare execute its strategy by steamrolling mainstream new car dealers out of business at a nickel to a dime on the dollar is unconscionable and unthinkable. And then there's the GMAC finance arm of General Motors, the other side of the two-headed dragon that preys upon many mainstream car dealers. The ultimate act of this predator is to finish them off with suspension of their floor plan lines. The government long before removing the CEO of General Motors, acted this past January to remove the chairman of GMAC. He has now been indicted by New York State Attorney General Andrew Cuomo for two and a half billion dollars of illegal investment transfers to the Ponzi schemes of Bernie Madoff. So how does all of this highly decadent behavior manifest itself? One needs to go no farther than examining the compensation formulas and incentive plans within GMAC. This closely held subsidiary of Cerberus Capital Management has apparently presumed itself to be bulletproof from the scrutiny of Enron-style dealing. The finance company has demanded extortion payments from mainstream car dealers at an alarming rate in recent years while at the same time dangling their floor plan lifelines in front of them. And once again, you, the American taxpayers, have been duped. The federal government first saved GMAC from bankruptcy on New Year's Eve with a $6 billion infusion. Then GMAC applied for a new charter and shortly thereafter was granted bank holding company status giving them even greater access to the $700 billion that our Congress authorized last fall. Finally, our government recently provided them another remarkable sum of money to enhance the floor plan portfolios of a considerable number of politically correct car insiders. Even as these volume-oriented outlets have been commissioned to take over distressed inventories of many targeted for elimination car dealers, how did they gain instant approval to raise their own floor plan ceilings? 
This mayhem and madness must be exposed at the highest levels of corporate malfeasance and prosecuted at both the civil and criminal levels. In 1984, Mr. H. Ross Perot sold his beloved EDS to General Motors, earning him a cherished position on its board of directors. Two and a half years later, in its infinite wisdom, GM voted him off the board 14 to 1. Before Mr. Perot accepted $750 million in extortion money, he publicly petitioned the stockholders to fire the existing board, proclaiming he would not accept their bribe to just go away. Tragically, the stockholders either were not sophisticated enough to understand what was really going on, or lacked the collective willpower to take the bull by the horns, or some combination thereof. Just four short years later in 1990, the general public, for the most part, never realized that General Motors was already flirting with bankruptcy. Then, in the 1992 presidential campaign, Mr. Perot, through his visionary leadership of the Reform Party, warned the American people about the treachery of our two-party political system and where it was headed. Seventeen years later, we see how prophetic and deadly accurate he was in his assessment. At this unique moment in history, the franchised new car dealers of mainstream America own an equity stake in General Motors, the very company which is trying to destroy them. You, the American taxpayers, own a 60% majority of this company. It is imperative that you demand the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Our corporate governance is at stake, as is the future of our country. For insight into the seven deadly sins of General Motors and its corporate strategies and behaviors that have led to a train wreck of its franchise system, simply examine the apparent failure of Bill McDavid Pontiac Buick GMC in Fort Worth, Texas two decades ago. The apparent failure of R.O. Evans Pontiac Buick GMC in Dallas, Texas almost a decade ago. The apparent failure of the Holly family in Brownwood, Texas. The apparent failure of the Young family in Sherman, Texas the apparent failure of the Dobbs family in Hillsborough, Texas, or the ongoing nightmare of the 50-year forest family tradition in Cleburne, Texas. In much the same way that General Motors created a political environment of dealer councils to help identify, channel, and silence criticism, so has our political system institutionalized hopelessness and apathy in the hearts and minds of many citizens and voters through the dominance of our two-party system. We must wake up, restore our corporate governance, and take back our country. If we choose not to do so, we may experience a bloodbath between the metropolitan and mainstream car dealers of America. And even more disturbing, given the politics of our time, the next civil war in this country might be fought between the old folks and the young folks.